I thought I would be able to get a ride just because coming from GP, but honestly, nobody was interested. This, and this is why I really like the championship because whatever championship can you go out, buy a bike, and in your first race, be successful. Another difficult year. Well, all my years in Moto2, um, you know, and I held, held my hands up, I just didn't gel at all with, with Moto2. I'm a realist, but there's a lot of people saying I'm a dark horse for this year. Um, but really, I've never won a BSB race. A Celine Dion song. Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually a big fan of Celine Dion. <laughs> Welcome to Alton Park. Welcome to round two of the Bennett's British Superbike Championship. We're up on the roof of Completely Motorbikes, Kawasaki's hospitality unit to introduce you to the first of two shows from the beautiful Alton Park in Cheshire. This first show is the 2015 Moto3 World Champion. He moved to Moto2 with no great success, who then coming back to the British paddock with Stock 1000, finally got the chance he deserved in the Bennett's British Superbike Championship. And this year he rides for McCams Racing. That's Danny Kent. This is Off Track, the motorcycle racing podcast. Danny Kent, welcome to Off Track. Yeah, thanks for having me, mate. Nice to see you, mate. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Actually, absolutely marvellous. Nice to get yeah. back to a race circuit for the first time since Brands Hatch last year. Oh, it's been, been a long time for you, then. This is my longest in 10 years. So it's, it's been nice, nice to be back. No, that's not. <laughs> no, no, the last week has been horrendous. Yeah. And then watching from Navarra, which we'll come to for you shortly. Yeah. Um, I like the new uniform, mate. Yeah, thank McCann's you. McCann's racing. Yeah. No, very pleased and um, happy to be part of the McCann's racing team. Um, you know, everybody, for, for any rider in BSB, really, it's a team that anybody has their eyes on and, and, and they're a team that any rider wants to ride for. So, um, no, I feel very lucky and privileged to, to be part of, of McCann's racing. Tell me about the last few years. We'll come on to McCam's racing and, and the last couple of years in BSB shortly. Yeah. But the the switch from Grand Prix back to the UK, talk me through that time as, as a rider perspective because 2015 Moto3 world champion. Yeah. Can't miss that out because nobody's ever going to take it. a decade ago now. Many, actually, eight, yeah. nine years, isn't it? Yeah. Jesus Christ. You were nipper back then. I was, yeah. A yeah. proper nipper. But to... to we see it more and more now with, with, with social media and race politics and things like that and how it goes on. Yep. Talk me through that part of, of your career. Let's get the, the the negative points out of the way first and then we can move on to the good stuff. So what was it like for you back at that time? Well, it was difficult, really. Um, let's say I won the World Championship 2015, living you know, the dream as such. Um, then I had... Uh, the 2016 moved up to Moto2 with Leopard, didn't have such a successful year. I was teammates with Miguel, but me and Miguel was having very similar results. Um, um, and then 2017 was with Kiefer, that fell apart, it just wasn't working. Um, and then after that was with uh, Speed Up, and that was just... Uh, Another difficult year. Well, all my years in Moto2, um, you know, and I held, held my hands up, I just didn't gel at all with, with Moto2. Um, no matter what I did, what bike I tried, what team I was with, I just wasn't fast on Moto2. Um, which was why after I got dumped by um, Speed Up in 2018, I was then, I sort of said, maybe I can't ride a bigger bike, let's go back to Moto3 and sort of do what the, they used to do in, back in the day and just sort of had a career on smaller bikes and earn a good bit of money. Um, but no, things had changed by then and um, you know I was having meetings with Grassini and I actually we actually agreed on the deal for the following year for me to go back to Moto3 um, and then at uh, the very last minute um, Dawn had put a stop to it and um, said there's a they, they they wanted a young I think it was a Spanish or Italian rider which was going to be put on that seat um, so then there's me thinking I'm definitely not going to get a ride in Moto 2 just because I've been given a lot of opportunities and I've never succeeded at it. Um, and now I've felt that obviously I've won Moto 3, Dorna didn't, maybe didn't want me in there. Um, then that was sort of the first time in my career where um, I sort of had to, because each year, like in my GPs, I, I don't know subconsciously, you just know that you're going to get a ride the following year. There's always something I didn't in the think final, it. I, and up until then, I didn't, I didn't think that it was going to end as abrupt as it did. Um, and what didn't help was I got halfway through the year with Speed Up in 2018. Um, and I was walking around the paddock in Aragon. 
and I was hearing rumours and people come to me saying, oh, Luca Bottafura has been speaking with um, Erta about replacing you for the remainder of this year. So then obviously I've heard it, I've gone to the team manager um, and asked him about it and he said there's no truth in that at all. So I thought, okay, even if there were some truth, then maybe I could have then got the ball rolling trying to Absolutely. sort something out. Um, we had the test on the Monday after Aragon, um, flew home on Tuesday and on Wednesday I got the call from them saying that they've replaced me for the remainder of the year with, um, oh, it's not not Axel Pons, he's got a brother. It was a, it was a Pons. Oh, okay. Um, the only one I can remember is Axel. Yeah, I can't remember his first name, but it nothing was, ever came of it, did it? No, it, that was, that no, was it thing. didn't last. Didn't last long then. But, but yeah, so um, and then that is Aragon was the last time I've ever ste- ste- stepped foot in a GP paddock. I've never actually been back since. Um, and then after that, um, the following year, I was obviously I knew my time in GPs had, had come and gone. So then I had to sort of think of what what next. Um, and then I was speaking to World Supersport teams, speaking to um, British Superbike teams. And it was, I thought I would be able to get a ride just because coming from GP. But honestly, nobody was interested. Or they, they, show, they, they show an interest, but nothing ever, ever materialised. Um, and I got a lot of feedback for basically saying that... Um, my whole career had been um, outside of the UK. I'm talking now, let's say, for BSB teams. Yep. My whole career had been basically outside of, of the UK. So in 2007, eight, I did the British Super Teens. But then after that, I was got signed up by the Red Bull Academy where I was started in the Spanish Championship. So um, they said, I've got no experience on big bikes. And the big bike experience, which was Moto 2, I wasn't good at or I had no success at. Nobody wanted to take the risk. Um so there was a couple of years where, and then I'd go to World Supersport and they was asking for 250, 300,000 euros, which just obviously wasn't feasible. Standard price. And even if it was feasible, then I, I would probably wouldn't have done it yeah. anyway. Um, so yeah, it was a couple of years where I literally had nothing. And then and my life completely turned around because from a young age up until 2018, I knew every week I had like a, a plan. I'm flying here, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You're in the bubble, weren't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, bubble, everything I was in the was bubble there. and it was all happening. And it, yeah. You know, I, I got emails where you, you're at this airport at this time and then you're flying here and I'm there to a time where I woke up in the mornings and I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, my life had completely changed massively. Um, how do you deal with that? Yeah, it was difficult. How, do, how did you it adjust? Was, it was difficult. Um, and then obviously from a young age, yeah, I left school early. Um, I sort of got back in contact with friends that were friends at school, but obviously it's been, I don't know, 10 years and everyone's changed. So, um, then moving forward, um, I just, I said, racing, I want to continue racing. That's all I've ever known. And it's what I want to do. So what can I do to continue racing? And I had a sponsor at the time. It was, um, Dave and Mandy from platform hire, um, um, we come together and we made decision saying that from for my career to go forward, I have to go and prove that I can ride a big bike on English tracks. I wasn't getting the opportunity in super bikes. And then the next best thing really is stock thousand. So they kindly sponsored me and um, it was during the COVID year. So I only got the, it was the year 2020 when... Um, six rounds. Yeah, six rounds. Yeah. And I can remember before round one, we all did, well, some stock teams joined in with a superbike test at Croft. I'd never been to Croft. It was the first time, yeah. <laughs> and it was a private private test, but there was a lot of superbike teams there. Um, and I was there on the Stocker. Um, and it turns out I was flying that day on the Stocker and I was actually just as fast as a lot of the superbike boys. Um, and on my way home, I just got a random message from Steve from Hawk, to be fair. And um, he goes, was watching you out on track today, absolutely flying. Um, just to let you know, I'll be keeping my eye on you during this 2020 season um, for, for next year. So obviously that was- How much of a lift did that give you? Oh, it was massive because obviously I wanted to go to Superbike anyway. And, and you know, I, I've i even spoke to Steve beforehand and he was one of the people, not dropping him under the bus, but- A little bit. 
Little, but, but then you pulled him out again. Yeah. <laughs> but he was one of the people, one of the teams that I spoke to about going to Superbikes. And, um, and and I understand it because it's, they, they have, it's a lot of money. They put a lot of their own money in it, sponsors money. And they are, they need to deliver results. And sometimes it is a risk. 100%. And, if, and the way I look at it, if I was a team manager and I was in, in the equation, I'd probably also... It would be hard for me to sign myself just because of those same reasons. Are you getting all grown up thinking yeah. it that way? I like yeah. that. But, uh, but it's, it's but, the only way, though, isn't it? Would you I, sign cause you? Because I've had to think about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, that was a, it, that was really good to get that message from him. I had um, the, the six rounds on the stock sit, uh, stock 1,000. Had a few pole positions. Um, won the final race at Brands. Four podiums, three poles in a race. Yeah, you know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know more than me. So... Um, and that was the first year I'm running on British tracks and on a big bike. So I felt that I did enough to um, show that with time I could be fast on English tracks on a big bike. But it's a super competitive class as well. So to go into it is, Stock yeah. Bowser, for me, I thought was such, a, and we we spoke about it at the time because we've seen yeah. each other track over the years. Yeah. It, it, for me, that was such a bold move to go, okay, I'll show you. I'll earn my stripes on a big bike. I, it, was, it was my only move I could do for, me, for my mm. career to go forward because if I didn't do that, I would, don't know what I'd be doing now. My racing career would have come to an end. She beggars belief. I know, I know. Um, but I think we've mentioned it before. My biggest regret in racing is after my 2015 season winning the championship, I did have the option to go to MotoGP with a few with a few teams, one being Pramac, one being Aspar, but it was the year Aspar was on the, um, oh, what was it? when they CRT. Were the, the, yeah, the CRT Hondas. Yeah. It was the, and it was a year that they were switching brand next year, the following year, but they didn't know what bike they were using. So they offered me a contract, but they couldn't put in there what was bike. 16, they, 17, somewhere around that. Yeah, it, this was for 16, 12, 16, 16, yeah. yeah. Oh, after so the jump. Yeah, yeah, so the jump, that, um, but the, looking back now, and just the way that um, team managers' heads work, even if I'd won Moto three and jumped straight to Moto GP, even if I'd done terrible in that year in Moto GP, just because I was an ex Moto GP rider, yeah. just that my, I it would have been a lot easier for me then to come to BSB, and I'm I'm ninety five percent sure I would have got a, a superbike contract. Straight away, just because I'm an ex MotoGP rider. For the way it works, yeah, you've ridden a big bike at the highest, yeah. the biggest bike exactly. at the highest And level. it's just the way that team managers are, are work. Um, and I've, yeah, and it's just, it's just in, obviously all the years have gone by and I've sat and thought about it. Um, but at 21, um, I chose money over, and again, we go back to, I didn't think my career was going to end as, a, as abrupt as it did. Um, I thought I had many more years in, in, in GPs, um, but yeah, I, that is my biggest regret is not going. My regret is choosing money over GPs. Where was the guidance at that time? Well, it got a bit tricky because um, up until that year, 2015, I was managed by Roger Burnett, um, but then the owner of Leopard, um, he was pushing me because he was wanting to be my manager. Um, he was flying me to all the races in his private planes. Um, he flying me to Luxembourg, which because they're, they're based in Luxembourg, yes. offered me nice watches, houses, uh, apartments in Luxembourg. And at that age, you get offered these things. It's hard. It, it is bright lights, big city, and yeah. it? it's difficult not to be swayed by it. Yeah. And they know what they're doing. And it's crazy because like I never saw myself flying like a private plane. Yeah, they do exactly. They know exactly what they're doing. So then he pushed me to leave Roger as push me to leave Roger um and then turns out that 2016 um I was having a bad year with Leopard and he wanted enough the Leopard guy wanted nothing to do with me so then I was again was just, yeah it's um yeah it was it was tricky um so yeah making all those decisions without much guidance obviously I got my family of course. And my family got me, you know, if I wouldn't be here today and I wouldn't have got to World Championship and I wouldn't have won a World Championship without their guidance. But, you know, they're not um, business minded in, in any sense. Um, so, like, I just I just went with the flow kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, when you're 21 years old and you're getting offered, 
lots of money and nice, bright, shiny watches and those things. And it was quite... It's kind of having the world at your feet, isn't it? From from the, the, the adulation of, of winning yeah. the 2015 Moto3 World Championship, which aren't given out in Christmas crackers. No, that's right. That, yeah. that took some doing. And did, it, yeah. there was some fun. I don't know how I did it. Looking back, honestly, <laughs> I don't know how I did it. Did you have an eight-second lead at Kota? Do I remember? You, uh, you were the, there was one, I think it was Kota. I was watching it at work. Well, I had two in a row. So I had Argentina, it was 10 seconds. Yeah. And then it might have dropped down a bit. But then, yeah, it was Kota, was eight eight seconds. So. Which, it, it doesn't happen overnight. And I think it, it, it was important to talk about that time because I know I, I don't remember listening to a podcast with you explaining that story. We did the audio one a couple of years yeah. ago, didn't we? Yeah. But, but now we've... We're, we're a little more popular. Yeah. We were popular. Yeah, you've grown massively. Right yeah. But we've we, we got the video thing now. We've got the YouTube <laughs> thing going on as well as the audio. Um, I think it's important to get that story across because we've known each other get, getting on for 10 years. Yeah. And But to, to understand, for the listeners and the viewers to understand that story, for me, I think is fascinating because it, it ain't all roses. Oh, no, it's and not. And there are no. wrong decisions that have been made. But you've become, for me a better person and a better rider because of it. Yeah, 100%. I agree with you that I have become a better person and rider. I, I actually feel like I'm a better rider now than what I was back then. But again, back then I was a young kid. And to be fair, I, I'm not a massive, I'm not, I don't think massive deep into things. I just sort of go with the flow. And and I just think back to back then, like I just said then, I don't know how I won it, but I just, I got on the bike. I really enjoyed my time with the with the team. Uh, oh, things vibrating. There's naked forfeits for that, you know. <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> well, where was I? <laughs> Found a bit of a naked forfeit, Dan. <laughs> um, but then going back it and, and um, completely becoming awesome. a better person. Yeah. For the decisions that you've had to make and the wrong decisions you've made. Yeah, it, it, it's it put you on a different track. A yeah, better rider now. Yeah, that's where I was. Yeah. So I, I generally think I'm a, a stronger, and just because of the experience that I've had throughout the years and the hard times, it's made me. A better and stronger person um and it sort of made me realize having those years of not racing it's made me realize you know how much i love racing um and it's all i've ever wanted to do and it's all i've ever known so so when the opportunity that after that for, for me what was a successful stock thousand campaign for your first attempt with the a private team yeah run with yourself and um so it was Mo Morello. Yeah. Oh, Morello so, yeah, it? yeah, so it was Morello, it which was, Morello. was a very successful team in Stock Thousand. Um, they won... Steve Buckingham. That's it, Steve Buckingham. Um, he won championship with Danny Buckingham in the past and was successful with Josh Elliott. Um, so it was run by them, by the Morello outfit, and was totally sponsored by Platform Wire, which, which was Dave and Mandy. That was um, it. You were in his separate colours, weren't you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. His teammates were Fraser, and then his side was, was Morello. Um, but yeah, no, that was... Um, that was a, a the turning point, or that was the year that decision made my made to do that. I had to make that decision um, for my career in racing to continue. Hundred percent. How was it adapting to a superbike from the, stock to superbike? From, from go, just having you to adapt your. We'll come on to the Yamaha shortly. Yeah. yeah. But you having to to adapt your riding style completely to a bike with a hinge in the middle, compared to having years on a on a prototype stiff chassis. To then go from stock to superbike the following year on a Suzuki, what? How much did you learn about you as a rider in that time? You know, since jumping on on a thousand cc stock superbike, I've actually chassis wise because they're not so stiff. Where you got the movement, I've actually, I've actually really enjoyed my time being in in the paddock. Um, I just really enjoy riding the bikes. Um, I have struggled. Um, just because in GPs, Moto3, Moto2, and the style of the tracks where they're fast and flowing, you've got to keep your corner speed. Whereas now, well, I say now, this year, this year's a bit different, but as soon as I've gone to 1000cc with a Kawasaki, Suzuki, Honda, one of my biggest problems was that I was quite good at releasing the brake, but as soon as I release the brake, of opening the throttle. But on 1000cc with no anti-wheelie traction control, you can do that. And that much power, you can do it. So then obviously I was complaining of the bike running wide and then I was having to really wait, use the rear brake. So that was where I was struggling. Um, and again, I'm going to fast forward a little bit now, which is part of the reason why I made the decision 
for this year to race for McCams Racing was the, the Yamaha because I just knew, being out on track for a few years, being behind them, I just knew the Yamaha is my style of bike. I think it has, I would be amazed if it wasn't. Yeah. Because you look at two of the last three British Superbike champions, mm -hmm. their grounding is in Moto3. Correct. Kyle, Taz. Corner speed, yeah. It's corner speed. It had Brad and yeah. Taz. I've got Kyle on the thinking of that. But Kyle also has had you might be success. At the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Yeah. But for for Brad as champion, Taz as champion, and Kyle, what he's done on the Yamaha, that's yeah. better. Yeah, that's it. With their Moto3 background, it was a kind of a, a ready-made fit almost for you. It was, but... And that was my logic, and that was my thinking behind it, but obviously until I jumped on the bike and it was all guesswork, but I knew um the yamaha was the bike that i wanted to be on um and i don't know do you want to speak about it now we're with we might yeah we're there yeah, it's, we're it's there. fine we we can we can drop yeah off. so well, tell um, how the opportunity came about first with with mccam's with, with, racing, with racing well yeah. obviously um we started last year um and it i say i started my own team it wasn't really my own team i didn't own it i didn't put any of my own money into it um this all came about at the end of 2022 um it was a, a friend of my dad's, um, turned into a family friend, became a personal sponsor over the last few years. Um, he came to Brands Hatch, we had a few meetings. And then out of the blue, he says, after after we had those meetings with some some teams, he said, let's start our own team. And I was, and I was like, I don't think you realize how much it, or how much it, firstly, how much it costs, um, what it takes, it's not just a, turn up on Thursday, ride Friday, Saturday, Sunday, pack away, and then turn up again the following weekend, which I think he... It's what it looks like. It's what it looks like. And also, he had no experience in racing. He comes from construction. And yeah. and, and I think... and then, But he was dead honest. He said he wanted to start a team. First month of him saying it, I was dead against it. Um, but also, he had a bit of a health scare um, during that year. was told that he had to slow down on his business. And this was what he wanted to do, was start a superbike team, not knowing how stressful running a super bike team is <laughs> so basically he was um he paid for everything he was the title sponsor i know in in bsb and super bikes it's not just down to me and the bike um team personnel um it's what you, you can get to a certain level but if you haven't got the right um crew chief if you've ain't got the right um engineer then you, then you, you're not gonna be successful at all um so i went out there and picked or picked everyone that I thought and was available um, for team personnel. I did that. And then obviously um, throughout the years of my racing, I knew some, some of the smaller sponsors where they sort of give us like free material kind of thing, which saves a bit during the year. Um, so yeah, he, it was his team. Um, he employed me to be his rider. Um, I just sort of, he had no idea about racing. And I guided him in the, direction of team personnel and uh, so you were kind of team manager and rider i, I was never <laughs> called team manager no but, but you're taking on that kind of role to help him yeah, guide yeah, where it needs to be yeah and but even my family as well because obviously they got me to where i was they they were helping um they were all throughout the winter we was down in um dorset cause they were based down in dorset they had a team lorry there we was loading the lorry i was helping load the lorry i was filling out the carnet for, to go out for Spain testing, which was all new to me. But to be fair, I, I did enjoy it. Um, but yeah, it was just... Uh, I have, No, I am grateful to them because obviously... Um, I obviously showed enough last year um, for me to to get signed by McCams Racing for this year. We had a great start to the season at Silverstone. Yeah, well, I we led... I think race three, we, we led a few laps. Um and then later down the line, we had two podiums at Brands Hat. Brands, yeah. And people are seeing this that it's, uh, you know, we, we were riding the bikes that we bought off, off the sponsor bought off uh, Javier Beltran from the factory Honda the year before. The bike, we basically bought Glenn's bike from the year before. Um, and we got parts of the da data for each round. Um, and we were doing a really good job. Like, and this is why I really like the championship because whatever championship can you go out and buy a bike and buy a bike and in your first race be successful. 
Um, Take some doing. It, yeah, especially against the competition and the knowledge that you got. Yeah, and I guess that's what I guess that's what opened some teams' eyes. Um, for and is what got me the contract for this year. Um, but then we had a bike. We had a failure on the bike at Thruxton, which caused quite a bit of crash damage. But then also at the same time, the sponsor was having some financial issues. Um, with his the main company, um, which was funding it all, and I got the call on the Tuesday before Cadwell, and he said, "I'm really sorry, Danny, but we can't go race anymore. It's, the, the money is is dried up, kind of thing." Which obviously I was disheartened because my whole every year that I've been in Superbike, I've never been able to complete a year. 2021, I got to round four, I had a crash, I did my hip in, was out for the year. 22 was I missed quite a few rounds because I had a crash and injured myself again and then 23 uh, got to Cadwell and then obviously this happened so I just um, I'm just thankful that up until then I've shown I had some good results and um, you know I've landed on my feet now and was signed by by McCombs Racing which I'm over the moon for the for- Tim and Sonia Martin, who who are Martrain. Yeah. How important was it for you to join a team that would run? We've said this before, and it's not disrespectful to any of the other teams. There are A teams, B teams, and C teams. Yeah. We have three levels in BSB. Yeah. Just for resources. Yeah. More than any, it's just yeah. it's purely down to that. They have they have some, and they don't have quite as much. So to move into an A team with Spanner. I think that's the fourth show on the bounce he's had a, a mention. Yeah. <laughs> I know I've been listening and he has been getting a lot of mentions, hasn't he? But with he's the, a good guy. He is. With the, and he was brilliant on the podcast and he was so looking forward to working with you this year. Um, because you went out to the Sunflower, didn't you? Yeah. It was your first. Yeah. First. That was been first, the first lap. Yeah. On so the bike. first time on, with, first time with the team, first time with the bike was on a, on a race weekend. Um, yeah. And then the weather wasn't great. It was delayed because of wind. Well, it was delayed the whole day. Um, but it was just nice to, um, I just wanted to get out on the bike before Christmas, before the testing band came in and um, just so that I can have the three, four months in winter and I can go over my head that I've ridden the bike and sort of understand. And I'm glad I did it because um, the Yam is a very different bike. You have to ride the bike completely different to what I have ridden um, the last three years. So changing that, so as we, as we spoke about before, that with each year, as you said, you, you've barely completed a year for injury or unfortunate circumstances with the team. Yeah. But you've had... Diff- I've, I've been lucky enough to land myself. You landed in, in a beautiful position on it. So now changing your riding style again. Yeah. Because you've gone from the Suzuki to the Honda to now the Yamaha. Yeah. What's been the biggest thing to adapt to on the Yamaha R1? Well, it's so... Like I mentioned earlier, the, the three years on the Suzuki Honda... Um, coming from GPs, I was really quick at releasing the brake, getting on the throttle really early, which the Suzuki and Honda, that wasn't the way to ride those bikes. Now I've jumped on the... So I've changed my riding style to adapt that to those, but now I've jumped on the Yamaha. It's, I've got to go back to how I used to ride in GPs. So the, the, just the way that the Yamaha... The, the sooner you get off that brake and on the throttle, the better the bike turns. Yeah. Um, so again, so it's just adapting back to how I used to ride years ago. Um but then it's just, it's a very rider friendly bike. The power delivery on it's so smooth. Um, and there's the, 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 the BSB championship, no, with no rider aids, the, the, the tracks that we come to like Alton Park, um, I think just riding the, the Yamaha. So the way I look at it, any rider that has jumped from one machinery onto the Yam, they've always um, done their best results. And I, again, I've proven that I've been able to do that since jumping on it. So. The decision I made for once is was a good one. Join second in the jump <laughs> as we sit here at Old yeah. Park before round two. Yeah. Round one. Really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Depends who you're asking. <laughs> yeah. But for, for round two of the Bennett's British Superbike Championship, Navarra looked such a solid weekend for you. And it, a couple of days, or three days, or two days of open pit lane, yeah. and then one session on the Thursday morning. Yeah. But then to go into a race weekend, which is different to what we're used to, qualifying two races on the Sunday. Yeah. But you, you came out of that with a second and a third and hanging, not not even hanging on, you were mixing it up with guys that are in their second year on Yamahas. Yeah. Third of one of them. 
Yeah, the third, third one. Yeah, 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 third for one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Big year for Kyle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> to to be to be running up the front with those guys who are the the factory supported team. That must give you a real buzz for for 2024 now. Sorrymate.com are specialist motorcycle accident solicitors that have decades of experience dealing with all types of motorbike accident claims. They know that having the right person represent you with your motorcycle accident claim can make a huge difference in all aspects of your journey to recovery that follows any motorbike accident. Sorrymate.com is run by bikers for bikers. I know the team well. They're genuinely great people who really care about their clients. Head to sorrymate.com to find out how the team can help you or just click the link in the description below. Oh, 100%. Um, and, you know, I was super excited before before we even went to mm. round one just because obviously I, I'm with a team that, you know, I've dreamt with, like, like you said, there's an A team, B team. I've It's been a long old road. I've got myself in with a team that I know I'm going into a year now where I've got everything to go out there and win races. Um so that's why I was excited. And then we turn up to Navarra, which is a track that is, again, similar to tracks that I've grown up on. It's in Spain, fast flowing, um, wide. Um, and then we sat down as a team. We had a, a structured plan. Spanner, you know, he's very methodical. He, we went there and he had a list of everything he wanted to try. Um, and even if it even if um, it wasn't working, at least we knew it like for, for later down the line that we tried it it didn't work um and and we were consistently um within the top four in testing and i knew we weren't throwing new tires in at it so i went into the race weekend really confident um i knew pace wise i was probably a tenth or two off of, at the time through testing it looked like kyle was the was the man to beat um but then come this is what didn't help our days testing in spain were a lot cooler um, and then come race weekend, the temperature had got a lot hotter, the track conditions, the degrees were a lot, lot warmer, which obviously does, gives us a little bit less grip. And the pace during our races were slower than what I actually thought was the pace was going to be because we did race runs in testing and they're actually probably a little bit faster than what our actual races were. Um, but no, I'm, I was, um, over the moon to come away with, uh, pole position, um, Again, that was my second ever Super Bowl. I did one before, which was Donington last year. Then obviously I missed the rest, rest of the year because I wasn't riding. Or they were cancelled due to weather. Yeah. Um, and then what didn't help was the rider before me, which was Bridewell, goes out there and he's blowing smoke. Ah, oh, yeah, you were the next one. Yeah, I was the next rider. Yeah. And um, they, it, it was red flagged for a few minutes, but I didn't get no information whether... The track was clean, yeah. but obviously you go ahead. They, they wouldn't have sent me out if it no, was dirty. You, tr anyway. you trust. Yeah, I, I had to. Yeah, you could have complete still, trust in race direction, but there's that little little man on your shoulder. Yeah, and I've got out there. There's only one fast lap, um, so I just went out of pit lane and just on my out lap, I sort of, I didn't push push, but I pushed to a point where, especially exit turn three, I really asked for a bit of pa a, a good exit, um, and I didn't have any problems. So um, also, what put my mind at ease, I watched Tommy's lap up until. He pulled off, even though there was blowing loads of blue smoke or whatever. He had no moments, which told me there was no oil jump going it's on. The his right rear thing. Wheel. Yeah. So uh, that's a little bit of confidence for you. But still, <laughs> it was there was that in the back of my mind. You can't not, can you? No, you, I it's think impossible any, any, any to. Rider, um, yeah. So to be fair, I did, wasn't expecting to get pole position, but I took it anyway. Um, I was really happy for for myself and for the McCams racing. Um, obviously, McCams racing was with race races. They've won lots of races and. Lots of poles um, with with their riders in the past, but obviously now they now um, they're run by Martrain. So I was really happy to to give um, Tim and Sonia their first superbike pole position, um, and then later that weekend give them their their first podiums as well. What's it like doing the super pole? Because it, it looks great for us fans sat trackside or at home watching. It's like this is so cool, mm -hmm. and you can't hear the music and stuff like that. No, nah. and I, I don't even know the song that you chose. <laughs> I'm even going down that road. It was just a song that um, I was out running. It was a random one which came on, and I found myself running fast to listen to it. So I thought, okay, I like this song. <laughs> yeah, works. yeah, it does. Yeah, and that, that is, you know, then You're I. You're a fickle bunch, I, riders. It's never I, worked. Then I become a fan of the song, and I just picked that one. So, Perfect. Yeah. So, what's it? To prepare for one lap, 
to do it in the the fastest, slowest time possible without, without having a mistake. without making a mistake. It's it's difficult. Um, and Navarro was really easy. The way I, f if I went out there during testing and went for a lap time, I ended up making mistakes because there's a lot of lot of corners there where you can, at the end of the back straight into turn nine, it's very easy to outbreak yourself. Same in turn three. What I found was to be smooth um, and concentrate more on exits rather than corner entry. Um, but yeah, if we managed to get the job done, so no, happy. And then into the races. Yeah, um, I started a bit stiff. I remember uh, race one. My starts at the moment are not that great on on the Yamaha. But I was saying that race two, I actually got the whole shot. But I shot off too early and cold, <laughs> drove around the outside of me. Um, Look well on the telly. Maybe not for yeah. you. Look at it. Around the outside. No, but, but the first couple of laps on race one, I was riding a bit stiff, and I and I could see Ryan was setting a good pace for starting to put away, and then I started to relax, go into the rhythm, and. Um, um, got into a good rhythm, was staying on the back of them. And then up until like sort of the last five laps, I thought I had a lot more. But then the, la the last five laps, my tyre just dropped off massively. Um, and I had nothing left. Um, those two were riding really, really well. Um, race two, um, we made a small change with the bike and it was night and day better. Um, I was getting a lot more better drive grip. Apart from that last corner where I was struggling a lot. Um, that's a nadgery little corner, that one. Yeah. You know, it had been reprofiled. Ryan, slightly, Ryan was just really good on the exit of there. Yeah. Um, and I don't know... Well, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was a setup. Yeah. Diff different setting, obviously different suspension, or, you know, we can play with how how much power we're being given in each gear kind of thing. So um, it was like a big yo-yo effect. I was really strong in, in the first two sectors, and he was really good in <laughs> the last th like, the last two sectors. Um if I could swap role reversals, I'd always pick his because obviously you're going to win the race in sectors three and four, not one and two. That's right. Um, but no, he didn't put a foot wrong up until the last lap, last <laughs> corner. Um, but yeah, so second to last lap, um, I had a moment. Into, I tipped into turn nine. For, for race two, the wind picked up and going into turn nine, we had tailwind. So it was, um, it was pushing us into that corner. Second to last lap, I tipped in and the front closed on me. And I was, in, in my, as I'm riding, I knew how hard I was pushing just to keep that yo yo effect with Ryan. And I said, I've got no more in it. I'm just, and I still, I think I had about maybe a second gap with um, Kyle behind me. I said, I'm gonna, gonna set off a second here. Um, and I, I just think it's been a great weekend, pole position, had a third, and I'm running in, in a safe second here. So I was looking back at the, the race run and the whole race, I was matching um, Ryan's lap times until the last lap where I dropped it by 0.8 of a second. And I crossed the line. Ryan obviously had that moment in the last corner. I crossed the line 0 0.2 behind him. And I'm thinking to myself, ah, oh, if only I didn't shut off on that last lap or take it a yeah. little bit easier. But then, again, that's just something like looking back. I could have carried on pushing and then crashed in turn nine. But that's a, a, not... as close to a guaranteed second place. Yeah, exactly. It, every low tap but, but that's as that was as close to a guaranteed second place as you can and you took it so small wins yeah exactly yeah rather than picking gravel or ended up 10 because you've got to pick the bike back. um and we left round one with joint second championship so um no it was a very positive and successful first round for for me and the team alton park is, is a completely different proposition it is yes we're just off the back of a, a two-day test we're on a rest day today action on track starts again tomorrow on saturday yeah. What's it been like adapting to Alton Park on the Yamaha? Because it is a completely, it's a unique well, it's, it's night and day. Um, Navarra's flat, wide, smooth. Um, then we come to Alton Park where it's quite narrow. It's up and down. Um, and just traditionally, um, Alton Park's been a, a, a difficult track for me. And it, and it has been for a lot of riders in their first, I don't know, three, four years. I was speaking to Kyle the other day, and he said it, it, it took him four years to. Kyle didn't really gel with it until last year. It and Taz was, and Taz was the same. Obviously, I'm working with Spanner, yeah, and Spanner was crew chief in, with with Taron, and he was exactly the same. And it's just at the moment, I don't, I haven't got the pace to go out there and fight for wins or podiums at the moment. But I'm sure now I've got the team and everyone around me. Um, with time, um, it will come. I'm just not in a position at the moment where I don't think I can do that here at the moment. 
the interesting thing for this season is going to be back to back in. Yeah. When we come back in September. Yeah. And see what the difference is then. Yeah. And I think w- one thing I like about the the the, the twenty twenty four Danny Kent is how much you you thinking about you your career and your approach to racing mm-hmm. because of what we discussed at the start of the of the show. Yeah. To to sit and listen to that is really refreshing and. The, does it give you the confidence as well? Now you go, okay, you're not rushing into anything. You've got the, the team around you. You've got mum and dad still there. They're just in the background nicely. They're still yep. there. Yep. What What's your approach now for the rest of this season? And come brands at the end of the year, what would make a successful season for you? Um. Well, I, I'm a realist and I always have been. Um, and, I've, and I know that Oldham Park, Cadwell Park's, um, are the same my bogey tracks. So I just have to make as many points as I can. I know it's going to be damage limitations um, during those rounds. But like you said, we have two rounds at Alton Park. So we try and learn as much as we can. Try to, you know, yes, yesterday during testing, I've set my fastest ever lap time that I have done round here by a good margin. I think by nearly 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8. Um, still, it only puts me 10th on the, on the timing sheet, but still it's my personal best. Um, so no, we're going to, Obviously, I'm going to go out there and push as hard as I can and try and Absolutely. get the best results I can for me and the team. Um, but um, the, the the goal is for us here is to learn as much, trying to understand how to ride Alton fast for when we come back here later in the year. Um, and then, obviously, we've got Donington Park next, where the Yamaha is, is a great track for Yamaha, and it's a track that I actually really enjoy. It's just it doesn't like me because I've got all my injuries, touch wood, if always come from Donington Park, but it's oh, a track. I haven't just said yeah. that. No, nah, but I'm not... <laughs> um, it's not my fault, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I said it, but yeah. Um, oh um, man! But no, I, I, I I'm going to feel good, so bad. I had some good results there, even on on yeah. Honda last year. So exactly. Um, we just have to the tracks that we know that I'm fast at, and the Yamaha works well out. We just have to make the most of it, like we did at Navarra. Maximizing opportunity, but and then also going into it. I'm I, I'm I'm a realist, but there's a lot of people saying I'm a dark horse for this year. Um, but really, I've never won a BSB race. I've had five BSB podiums, so I, you know, I don't come into this year thinking I'm going to win championship because obviously, if it becomes, if the opportunity be- presents itself, then I'll go. So then I'm it. doing it. But going into the year, like I just because I've never, I can't put myself up against people that have won multiple races and I've not won one yet. So. Um, you know, I started the year strong. My goal is to take each round as it comes. I know I've got the team, the bike, and all the people around me to go out and have a good year. Um, and coming back to your question, what would be a successful year is um, is to get some wins this year, Excellent. and and to become a a rider that people expect to be there, come every track. This is one. I love this. I, I genuinely do. I think it's absolutely meant. Um, our patrons, we have um, a great patron scheme. Um, if you're interested in becoming a patron, the link's in the description below. If you're listening on audio, it's in the show description. Um, we've got a couple of a couple of we've covered a little bit of it, but I want to go back to the um, to name check the patrons for for what they've done and supporting us every uh, yeah. every month that they do. Yeah. Um, Craig Lowe. When the news came about signing for Martre and everyone talked about how the Yamaha R1 would suit you, when you first rode it at the Sunflower, was it as as you expected or hoped it would be? And if so, how did it feel knowing that the talk about it all was right? It was exactly what I had pictured in my head. And obviously, like I said before, I'd ridden, um, ridden against these guys racing the, the Yamaha um, and just listened to their feedback. You know, sometimes, again, I've, I've listened to your podcast and you've been speaking to these riders that have ridden Yamaha and just the way that they speak about how it handles and turns. Um, I just knew it was a bike that I wanted to be on. And as soon as I jumped on the bike, I knew um, it was a bike that was going to suit me. So um, no, I'm just pleased that I made the right decision. It's so far so good. Um, Geralt Ellis, you have one race to plan. What track? What bike? And five other riders, past or present, to join you oh, on the circuit. Good question. That's perfect. I love that. I mean, yeah, that, that is, on that, a regular basis. That is, That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I've not heard that question. Me before. neither. That's a good one. Um, so what, track, what track, bike, and five other riders to join you on it. Bike. I'm going to choose a Yamaha. Yep. Um, 
track. Uh, can it be around the world? Want, yeah. I would pick Assen. It's such a shame we don't race there anymore. Oh, I can't. I just, be so obviously, because cool. obviously I've done a lot of GPs and we raced there and I got my first ever Grand Prix podium in 2012 there. Um, I just I would love to race there again. Um, and then five people, past or present. Um, it would be, I would pick Jack Miller, Mark Marquez, Valentino Rossi, um, who else? Two more. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Uh, Kevin Schwantz. Great shout. Um, and Hager. No. <laughs> no, Yuki Hager, yeah. Do you know what? Yeah. Even having those five on track, imagine the party afterwards. Yeah, but that... <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you've yeah. Jack, yeah. it's like, ah, oh, yeah. 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 You were teammates. Yeah, so I've raced with Jack yeah. for a few years back in the day. Um, they, he was a great guy. Um, and also, we've had some great races together in Moto3, so yeah. The, um, Mick Strickland. Uh, we've covered this a little bit, but you can go into this a little bit more. How did the ride come about for 2024? Did it seem to escalate a little bit quickly after Thruxton? Yeah, well, um, yes, yeah, so I got the phone call. Wasn't racing at Cadwell. And then obviously I'm, I'm, I, my brother was racing that weekend at Cadwell. So I was there. I had to show my face. And obviously I was trying to secure a deal for myself for the remainder of the year and for the following year. Um, and so much happened that weekend. Um, I was up and down with Stuart Higgs and, and had a few few options. And there was two options that I could have rode for for different teams for the remainder of the three years. Uh, three rounds, sorry. Yeah. Um, but for me, in order for me to do that, I had to sign a contract for 2024. Um, so then again, I had to sit down and make a tough decision. Do I? Um, but then also I had this deal uh, with McCambers Racing, but then you have to sit and wait for that one to come for October for the Sunflower. Exactly, yeah. I have to, for me to do that, I'd have to miss the final three rounds. But and I went with my gut. I knew I wanted to jump on a Yamaha. Um, and like obviously Tim and Sonia, um, no matter where they've been, they've always ended up winning. Um, I know they they were going to be running the team. They haven't won the Superbike, but. Obviously, the people they had coming on board. Um, I went with my gut and um, I decided to sit out the final three rounds of last year um, just so I could um, confirm to ride for McCombs Racing for 2024. I just, I'm not checking my phone for any other reason than five past two. We're okay. Well, 10 minutes or so. Because I know you've got to be away for half Yeah, I've got Eurosport. Excellent. Um, right. I'll just put that down there. Yeah. Number one. Balls to that. Um, you've listened to these questions enough. It's your turn. So, we've got a handful of questions. And would you like to go odd or even? Go even. <laughs> what no, happened? No, because the, the, the first one, uh, question number one is my favourite, but it's fine. We'll go odds. Uh, we'll go even, sorry. Yeah. Um, What's the one thing you wish you'd enjoyed more? One thing that I wish I enjoyed more. Um, maybe my time in, in GPs. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people think that you're yeah, traveling the world and you're seeing a lot of nice places and, um, and I, and I did, but I didn't take it. You know, I was there to do a job and, um, I was there to do that job. Um, there could have been a lot during that time I could have gone on from what they say America could have flew to another part of America and spent a few days there. just just enjoyed it a bit more trying to be in the moment yeah but when you're in that bubble yeah you're going from one place to yeah, another. Like imagine back, it's difficult looking back it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a blur mm. like, and a bit of a blur but yeah maybe that who do you admire most from another sport who do I admire most from another sport I'm these, these kind of questions I'm so rubbish at <laughs> being put on the spot 
Because I'll be sat in bed tonight and I'll be thinking, oh, why didn't I say anything? <laughs> <laughs> so because uh, being put under pressure like this... Um, you knew what was coming, Danny. I did, yeah. Um, admire from another sport. Um, you know what? I don't even follow football at all. But I've read things about the way Cristiano... No, can't even say his name. Ronaldo. Ronaldo. You know, the way he goes about his his life, um, you know, how dedicated he is towards sport. And the money he gives away to charity. Yeah. So the philanthropy is incredible. Yeah. For setting up academies. No, he's in that 100%. That's so, the kind uh, of person you want to get. If you had that kind of money, you follow that kind of yeah, model. Yeah, and then you? he gives blood and everything. And um, I know he doesn't have tattoos because of, for that reason. So, it's, yeah. No, I nice. Can't so. What's your best chat of life? Oh God! <laughs> I don't. I, honestly, I don't have one. Go back to those nightclubs with you and Scott Redding and Bradley Smith. And I never <laughs> had one. I never had one. I got too drunk. <laughs> I'm more honestly. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I honestly, I don't have a chat. No. <laughs> Hi, I'm Danny Kemp. <laughs> <laughs> that might have worked years ago. Don't anymore. <laughs> Who's the most famous person in your phone? Um. Jack Miller, Jorge Lorenzo. Um, yeah, it's a, yeah, it'd probably be those. True. Off, yeah. top, off the top of my head. Yeah. Who's your celebrity crush? Oh, God. Um, Sorry, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't really have one anymore. I was, but it's weird that it come up in convo because. Um, Come up in convo with me and my girlfriend the other day in the car because um, the song came on and it was the back theme song to when I don't know if you know One Tree Hill. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was saying, she asked me, Oh, did you used to watch that? I was like, Yeah, I said, I used to have a big crush on Brooke, which used to be the actor in One Tree Hill. Um, so, but that was when I was younger at the moment. And now I, you know, that stuff like that. Out of these that no, it doesn't, so... it doesn't even cross my mind. <laughs> I had that question and I have no idea. Yeah, no, I literally, no. I I could just pick somebody random, and I couldn't even tell you that like their screen names or their no. real names anyway. So this it doesn't work. So this is this is my favourite one, and can compared to what we said earlier on about the um, the music for your Super Bowl lap. Yeah, you're on your own. Yeah, in the car. Oh uh, yeah, turned up to eleven. Yeah, just you singing away. What's your guilty pleasure? The Celine Dion song. Oh, for a minute. <laughs> I am actually a big fan of Celine Dion. <laughs> Wait, you're making these reels for me without even doing it. Yeah, no, actually. Um... But what's your favourite Celine Dion song? Ah, uh, there's a few. Um... I know. Can I get the list up? Do it. Just get your playlist on, mate, because it's going to be on. No, I, I have played. <laughs> I listen to some weird stuff, and they, and people will be like, "Why did you listen to that before a race?" Because I, I don't, so sometimes I don't even know what they're saying, but I just like the sound of it. <laughs> um, where am I? This has been a, jo- a voyage of discovery for you as well as me. <laughs> yeah. So it's Celine Dion. You're going to be like, think twice and, and things like that. Yeah, so, real, so it's not real... a newer ones, it's her older ones. No, the older ones are so, the better ones. Um, the one like, I'm alive, the power of love, my heart would go on. Oh, you're doing the Titanic thing. Is that all a Titanic song? No, the, the heart, my heart will go on is Titanic, yeah. And um, then A New Day Has Come. To be fair, there's I Celine like Dion. I just like her voice. I yeah. think she's got a great voice. Honestly, right? This, this, is, yeah. I love this. Do you know she's French? Yeah, yes. listen, French yeah. Canadian, yeah. You're never thinking from when you listen to her singing. No, right? nowhere near. No. Last two questions. Yeah. First one is in two parts, as you know. Favourite corner and why? Uh, Favourite corner and why? Um... So I'm just trying to think of the generally enough. I got to think there's a lot of tracks I've ridden around the world. So, um, Mookie Heights uh, for the pilot is a good one, but depending on wind and wind direction. Um, but I also, I'm rubbish with corner names. What's the one that runs out after the back straight, the right hander? Oh, Sheen Curve. Sheen Curve. Yeah, I think that's such a. Because you go in there and when you tip in, you think there's no way I'm stopping. But 
it's just in the nature of the corner you get into the middle of the corner and suddenly the, it pulls you in and the bike turns it's beautifully cambered Brad, yeah. isn't it same with um sterling's the next left is, yeah. is quite it, bold isn't it it's... right well brands is one of my favorite tracks of, of all time i actually really enjoy brands but yeah um i really enjoy um that corner um it's just the, the feeling that you get when you go through it, the adrenaline. Like, you, I, there's been so many times where I flipped in and I thought, oh, no, 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 I'm not making it. But then from the middle of the corner, because it starts turning you, and I think, oh, I've actually could have gone in there quicker. <laughs> but you're approaching it and you're, you're feeling yourself. Last question. There's a high cost story, is it? Uh, um, you've had at least a fortnight to think about this as well. <laughs> Um, so high car, um, there's a few to be fair, but I might have told you, um, when we did this a few years ago, but we've got more listeners now, uh, high car story. Um, well, with Red Bull AO team, we were banned. We weren't allowed high cars just because of the mischief and why Danny just, <laughs> um, I think it, you know, one of them was, um, because Lewis Salom actually, and I remember it was. Um, Magello it just started to get dark. It was after all the racing, and um, we, as you're going, you had to cross the track, and he ended up doing a doing a race that. But he ended up in the gravel, but the the gravel was so deep, it gravel like the the stone just no. took out the, both sides of the car. Um, and then there's another one. It's not even a good story. It's just one that, again, it was with Ao, and it was with. Aki Ayo's son, Nicholas, which was an ex-rider, he's now a crew chief for, for them. We was in Australia and we just, it was a hotel, you pull off the main road into the car parking spot. I'm sat in the back. He's gone into the lobby, he comes back, but he doesn't, he must not have looked, but he just reverses, but reverses onto the main road. So I'm looking there for the next one, I've seen this car come, takes the car out, but then it turns out that in Australia, they didn't take out the complete insurance, so they had no. to. Yeah, so I think it was about fourteen thousand dollars worth of oh. damage, and no damage to you, thankfully. Like, yeah, thank you like the yeah. life flashed before your eyes. Yeah, but I just remember looking left, and luckily it wasn't a, a fast road. Um, and I'm sure. Oh no, I got another one actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this is why I stay quiet. Yeah, um, <laughs> and it's like we was. It was 2016. Teammates with Miguel Oliveira. <laughs> He was driving down the motorway, he was driving, but his window was down and he went, his phone was up there, he went to grab it and he, and he was talking. But at next minute, for some reason, his phone ended up flying out the window on the motorway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're just good days, aren't they? The good days. Yeah, like think, thinking back, um, um, I had some big times, really good times. Still some good times to come, mate. Listen, yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, really get that feeling about it. And, and I hope the, the listeners and the viewers of both sides have, have taken a lot from this and, and got to under, yeah, understand. Yeah, it's been good. Danny yeah, I've been glad a little to, bit more. To come on. Yeah, thank but you. Let's do this again later in the year. Definitely. All the best for this weekend. Cheers. And for the rest of the season. Let's do it later in the year. Thanks, mate. Ladies and gentlemen, Danny Kent. Thanks. Thanks, man. Cheers, man. Appreciate that.